Welcome everybody, we're gonna get started. Um, we wanna thank you for joining us this evening. So this is our fifth and final broadband conversation as part of the Fox Island Broadband Task Force's Community Broadband Campaign. The goal of this campaign is to share broadband, in, broadband information, education and options with the community with the goal of reaching community census to select and then be able to fund a universal broadband solution for Vinyl Haven. So tonight's conversation is gonna prevent, present an overview of the campaign. We're gonna talk a little bit about next steps and then we'll have a Q&A with task force members, select board members and the town manager, Andrew Dorr. So my name is Gabe McPhail. I work in the Vinyl Haven Planning and Community Development Office where I facilitate committee and town projects. I'm here tonight with Jan Ann Sherman, Fox Islands Broadband Task Force Chair. And we're joined behind the scenes uh, with our colleague, Matt Jablonski, who's our Island Fellow working for the town of Vinyl Haven. So before we get started, just like to do some quick Zoom etiquette for those of us who are joining in the Zoom room. First, if you can all stay muted unless you're speaking and please keep your video off if you are doing anything that's distracting or if there's something distracting going on around you. Otherwise, it's fine to have your video on. And we are definitely aware and have been throughout these conversations that a lot of uh, you joining us may not have great internet. So that is why we will um, put the meeting call in number and ID in the chat. So if you lose your Zoom connection and you need to call in by phone, you can do that. Um, just remember to mute and unmute on the phone is star six. We encourage you um, to rename yourself if you want to in um, your participants window. Um, you can add um, anything that's relevant to your name, your affiliation, pronouns, et cetera. And tonight, if you're joining us in the Zoom room and you have any tech issues and you need some assistance, please message Matt in the chat. Um, Matt's also going to give us his email address. So uh, if you get bumped out of the Zoom room and you need to email him for some reason, you can do that. So that's available on the screen and he's also putting that in the chat. And then just to keep things streamlined tonight, we're gonna take advantage of both the Zoom chat and the Facebook's comments feature to collect all of your questions throughout the evening. So as questions come up for you, please post them in either the Facebook comments if you're joining us on Facebook or in the Zoom chat. And once we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, we'll start, we'll um, take those written questions first. And then as time allows, we'll open it up uh, to verbal conversation where people can come off of mute and um, just ask their questions live. Uh, the other thing is um, if you hear any jargon tonight, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to um, explain the jargon, but if for some reason we uh, failed to do that and you need to know what words mean, uh, Matt's gonna put a link in the chat and Facebook comments that has our broadband glossary uh, so if you need to look anything up, you can do that. So I just want to give a quick overview before we launch in. This is what we'll be doing tonight. We're going to review the campaign and the timeline that we have been on and are on. We've created a campaign overview document that's uh, going to be a useful tool. And we want to present that along with uh, what one of our primary next steps, which is a community survey, the 2021 broadband survey. So we'll do that presentation and then we're gonna open it up for the Q&A and conversation before we wrap up for the evening. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Jan, and I, Jan, Ann and I are going to provide you with the background and the overview of the broadband campaign. So. Um, this was launched uh, officially in December 3rd of last year. Um, it's being funded through a broadband grant from the Maine Community Foundation. 
So we have three primary goals of this campaign. So one is really to explore the benefits and challenges of building and operating a broadband network by looking at the various ownership models that other communities have used to bring a universal broadband solution to their towns. So we want to use the information we've gathered, what we've learned, the research we've pulled together to help find a solution that best meets the needs of Vinyl Haven and what Vinyl Haven's broadband goals are. And then we really want to be able to, again, use that information to come to community consensus around which of those solutions serves us best and which one we could implement here. So just a quick timeline, um, just to recap sort of where we've been, what we've done. As I mentioned, we launched this in 2020 of uh, December. We uh, presented the 2020 broadband report, which is called the Vinyl Haven Internet Planning Document. This is available on our website and Matt's gonna put a link in the chat in case you haven't gotten a chance to read it, you can access it there. This provides a high level cost estimate of what it would take for Vinyl Haven to own and operate a universal broadband network. So we started our community conversations, uh, exploring various ownership models with other towns. We had people from other communities come and talk to us about the broadband models that they implemented. We looked first at a privately owned model, so private ownership by an ISP, a public private partnership in which uh, the town of Long Island partnered with um, Consolidated. We looked at an investor owned model. We also looked at a public model, so a municipally owned model. So recordings of all of these conversations are available on the town website and YouTube channel. And again, Matt is gonna put a link in the chat uh, so you can easily access uh, those conversations. If you missed any of them, they, they're all recorded. So during uh, throughout this time of the campaign, the task force has been doing some behind the scenes work um, that has included conversations with um, Fox Island Electric Cooperative. And this is because electric cooperatives um, in, in other uh, towns across the US have operated broadband networks themselves. So we wanted to investigate that model. We've spoken with our incumbent providers about expanding their networks. We've explored grant funding options to try to offset the cost of any build that we would do. And Jan Ann has been working hard to gather all of your stories um, about broadband, lack of broadband, the challenges you face, and has also um, been fielding a lot of broadband questions. So based on all of this work that the task force has done, what we've learned throughout the campaign, um, the, the um, task force had decided that um, in February, they wanted to present a request to the select board. And what they did was ask the select board to, um, to for, basically to grant them permission to explore our community's willingness, so everybody's willingness to support the construction and operation of a municipally owned fiber to the home broadband network. So the select board did vote um, to support this request. And hopefully by next week, the task force is going to be launching a community wide survey to see if generally, so it's kind of like a straw poll to see if people are willing to support this option of a municipally owned uh, broadband system for the island. So over the next few slides, we're going to present an overview, uh, again, a uh, background of the campaign, um, which will then um, lead into uh, an overview of this survey that we're going to launch. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jan Ann, and she can start us down that road. Thanks, Jan Ann. And you're just on mute there. Well, we've been kind of busy, um, or Gabe especially. And one of the things we decided to, to do was provide a summary of everything we've done, everything we've learned, 
all of that information, and that will be sent out with the survey. We put together a four page document. It'll be mailed along with the survey to everybody and it'll also be on the website. It's called the Vinyl Haven Campaign for Community Broadband Overview. Very sexy name. Um, it's available on the town website, on the town Facebook, and I hope we can get Matt to put a link on the chat for us. This document has got a summary of all the history, everything we've done, everything we've looked at over the course of this campaign, why the task force ultimately chose to recommend a municipally owned broadband to the select board. It's an explanation of the cost that it will be to the, to the town and also individually for the municipal broadband and an overview of the survey. This is, um, this is who we are, nine members of us. We were formed in 2015 after a Tilson study, which looked at uh, the broadband situation on many islands around Maine, including Vinyl Haven. And um, with that, the Board of Selectmen gave us a mission to look at what was possible, what we could do to provide affordable, I can't, I can't see the rest of the slide, but I, I'll, I'll paraphrase rather than read it to you. Um, affordable, future-proof, and inexpensive, we hope, certainly affordable uh, for everyone on the, in our community, regardless of where we lived. Okay, let's look here. A lot of things got rolling, got started in 2018 when I did a community survey. I sent out surveys to everybody who got mail on the island. And um, it was rather lengthy, but the bottom line was is it showed pretty widespread dissatisfaction with our two incumbent providers. Consolidated has a DSL system. It's on copper wires, kind of an antiquated system now. It's slow and the speeds degrade rather rapidly the farther away you get from a connection point. Spectrum uses a fiber backbone, but it connects from the fiber backbone to the home through coaxial cable. Coaxial cable has its limitations. The main one is that the system speeds slow down very significantly when there's a heavy load, as there is in the summer, or the evenings, and so forth. Let me see the next slide, okay. So let me just briefly review what we learned by looking at what other people have done. We talked to um, the town of Bremen. They formed a private partnership with a, uh, a local telecom company. The benefits of this were that the town didn't have to pay to build the network. They had no responsibility for providing the broadband. They applied for and got a small grant to kick in to help, but the community has no control over any of their internet options. It belongs to the ISP, they make all the decisions. So that was challenges, I would say negatives, but okay, challenges is good. The next one we talked to was Long Island. They shared their costs with, with a private ISP with consolidated communications. So the burden to build and operate the network was not solely on the town. The arrangement did not provide for any taxes, which was a, a plus as far as they were concerned. But the challenge was is that Consolidated Communications owned control of the system, the levels of service, and they charged um, all of the uh, customers to pay for um, their part of the system. The town still had to pay a certain amount into the, into the mix, and they were essentially subsidizing then a private company to build this and control it for them. Islesboro. They were the first and remain, I think, the, certainly the best known municipally owned system. They've been online now for a couple, three years, I believe. The town owns the full network 
They have for full control over the service. They're very um, committed to equity to keep the rates down, to keep the control local. They borrowed money on a bond to be paid off in 20 years. The challenges are that is the most expensive option. You're not sharing the cost with anybody else, but um, you're not sharing the control over the system with anybody else either. Although they managed to offset some of it by grants, the capital cost to build the network is paid through taxation. And Cliff Island. Cliff Island um, is, has their broadband provided by in, in a group of investors, an investor owned company. So the town does not have to pay to build it. They have no responsibility for pro providing the broadband. It is all on the investors. The investors make all the decisions, have full control of the system and of the service. And as um, was noted here, investors are sometimes reluctant to finance a project if they think the town is responsible for broadband and gets a little too involved in how it shakes out. Well, let's, let's look at us. <laughs> when we started out, these were our goals. We wanted to figure out a way to provide the fastest, most reliable technology with the longest lifespan, which is fiber to the home. Fiber has a long proven track record of lasting 30, 40 years with almost no maintenance and certainly very little um, cost to upgrade. We wanted local control so that the community of Vinyl Haven would define the terms of a contract that we would sign to get a company who has, a, has um, what should I say, has experience running ISPs for different communities, but we control the terms of what they do. We wanted to provide universal access to all locations on the island and perhaps ultimately to the outer islands. And you would pay the same and you would receive the same. You would get equitable service, all locations would get a thousand up and a thousand down, symmetrical speeds. Now your average person probably doesn't need that very fast upload, but anybody who's trying to run a business, who is trying to um, respond to classes, who's trying to post photographs of their products. I mean, there's many, many reasons why you need that fast upload speed, which is something, by the way, that coaxial cable cannot deliver. And we were absolutely committed to keeping the fees low. We wanted the subscriber fees. Well, we originally started with not to exceed $85 and we've come down and come down and come down and decided we must keep it below 50 so that everybody on this island could afford it. Basically what we're doing, I just wanted to say a few words about this, um, is, is what we're doing is a, a public utility. There's been lots of discussion, certainly in, since the, the uh, pandemic, on the importance of deciding that, that um, broadband is a public utility. Everybody needs it. If you wanna function in this economy, if you wanna be able to take classes from home, if you wanna work from home, if you just wanna stay connected to other people, this became very critically important to us with the pandemic. So our efforts to bring fast, affordable internet to all the town's residents is being handled just as we've long provided everyone with roads, electricity, schools, and so forth. We want to ensure everybody has equal access to the same service for the same cost. Those who can afford to pay a bit more are the ones who will pay for the majority of the system through progressive taxes. And we'll drill down on that in just a minute. But it's just the same way we pay for the public infrastructure now, roads, school, bridges, and so forth. 
we'll treat broadband infrastructure the same way. As a public infrastructure, we will all help pay for whether or not we personally use it. Let me, let, I'll let Gabe do the, the fun stuff and tell us what it's gonna cost. This is the very fun stuff. Thank you, Jan Ann. It, so, it's great news. <laughs> Jan Ann um, mentioned that um, when we are exploring options, you know, it's clear that the municipally owned broadband option is the most expensive option because you're not partnering with um, another ISP. So the burden is on the town, even if that burden is offset through grants. So um, it does, as she explained, it meets all of our goals. So it was the one option why we proposed it to, to the select board to explore was because of that. Um, it meets all of our options. And so the big question is what is this gonna cost um, and how do we propose um, we pay for it. So through this exploration process, uh, what we did was we took information from the 2020 broadband report, which estimated the cost for build out for an island wide fiber to the home network to be around 3.9 million. So what we decided to do was recognizing that there were some costs that were not included in that 3.9 million. The fact that costs are always underestimated, um, the fact that we you know, might want to include outer islands if residents there you know, want service. So we created sort of an overestimated cost that would not exceed 5 million. And again, this is the proposed cost to building a fiber to the home network to every location on the island with one tier of service, which is the thousand up, thousand down megabits per second symmetrical service. So as I mentioned, um, I just mentioned the outer islands. Um, so I just wanna clarify that, you know, the 5 million costs like may or may not uh, cover service to the outer islands. Again, this is something that the broadband report explores but doesn't go into great detail about. That would be a conversation with outer island residents and an exploration of if people want service and then what type of service, you know, do they want lines, do they want, um, uh, signal from a tower. So there's just a lot of factors we haven't explored with that. But but I just want to be clear that we we are willing and certainly um, will explore that as people are interested. So we're proposing that um, if the community was interested in pursuing this option um, and uh, what what how we would pay for it um, is that the capital cost would be paid for through a 20 year municipal bond. And that bond is paid for through taxation. There are a lot of broadband grants uh, available and we would apply for those grants to offset the cost. We are saying um, we believe we can offset that cost for around $1.5 million. But again, this is a figure based on our 2020 broadband report that uh, that could possibly be an adjusted figure because there is a lot more broadband money that is coming into play um, and likely will be more so. So the other thing we did was uh, use the 2020 broadband report as well as doing some additional research with other communities to come up with an annual operating cost for this system. So there are estimated annual operating cost is $400,000 and that would be paid for through subscriber fees. So we have the build out being paid for through taxation and the annual operating costs being paid for through subscriber fees. So that's an overview. What everyone really wants to know is um, how much is this, if, if this went through, if this proposal was approved by the town, um, by the voters, how much would it cost me? Like, you know, what, what, what am I gonna pay for this? So let's look at that. So let's start with the subscriber fees. So again, I just wanna say what this service is. It's fiber to the home. That's what Jan Ann explained what that was. And this, it's symmetrical service, a thousand over a thousand. And the way we are calculating our monthly subscriber fee is we're taking a potential 
total number of subscribers, which we've calculated as 1,432. And then we're saying, okay, what if 50% of these people or 716 subscribed to this service? What would that cost each person if we spread the cost, the $400,000 cost across um, 716 people? So that would be $46.55 a month or $558.60 a year. So of course, if you increased the number of subscribers, so anything above 716, it would mean more people were sharing the cost. So the potential for that monthly internet subscription cost um, is to go down. So that, that's a potential to actually pay less. So that's, that's the subscriber cost. Let's look at the debt service, what it would cost to actually build this system. This was what it would cost to operate the system. So what would your cost to be, what would your cost be to build this system? So we, again, are using this $5 million figure as a basis for calculating what our debt service would be uh, over a 20 year municipal bond. So based on our calculations, taxpayers would pay five, $5.08 per month per $100,000 of taxable real estate property value. So you can see on the chart what this means. If your property is taxed at $100,000, um, are you, is your taxable value $200,000 and so on. So that's what's outlined in the red box here. And you'll see the monthly debt service that each of those valuations would incur. So if I had a $400,000 taxable value, I would pay $20.33 per month uh, for the debt service. And then the Next uh, red line box that just came up, which is over to the right, that shows you uh, what the annual uh, debt service fee would be. So um, that's what you would pay each year through your property tax. So the green box in the middle shows you what your monthly cost would be debt service plus your subscriber fee. And lastly, all the way over on the right, we have um, a new green line box that just came up, which is the total annual cost for your internet subscription and your debt service. So that's what you would pay each year. So what we're wondering is how this compares to what you're paying now. So one of the primary goals, and Jan Ann mentioned this, was to make sure this was equitable, something that uh, was affordable, something that um, anyone would have access to. And again, this is what this service is, is it's super fast, it's reliable, it has a long lifespan. And uh, the questions we're asking you are, you know, what speeds are you paying for now? And then probably more importantly is what speeds are you getting now? Like you can take a speed test and see, are you getting what you're paying for? Other questions to consider when you're comparing what this municipal option might look like versus what you have now is how reliable is your service? Um, especially like in the summer, we often hear people complaining like, oh, everything's slowing down. There's two people on the, on the, um, on the network. Um, so really, you know, what does, what does this look like when you compare your service to what we're proposing for service? So um, let's also think about obviously what everyone talks about is not just the service, but the cost comparison. So we really encourage you to total up everything that you're paying for now. So that is like your internet, your home phone, um, any extra things you have like cable or satellite channels, calculate what you'd pay monthly um, for municipal, the municipal option that we're proposing. And to do that, you wanna take 
whatever your monthly debt service, um, excuse me, to calculate your monthly debt service costs, you want to take whatever your taxable value is, you're going to multiply that by $5.08, and then you're going to divide it by 100,000. So you may not have fit neatly into that table that we just presented of 100 to 500,000. So most of us don't um, have that clean uh, valuation. So uh, you would take your taxable value, multiply it by $5.08 and divide it by 100,000. So that's your monthly debt service costs. So then you would take your total cost for internet, which is your 46.55 per month, add it to your debt service and see what that monthly cost for you looks like. Um, if you wanted to add things beyond just the internet, um, what we know from doing research is that a lot of the digital phone services cost around $25 a month, and there are TV bundles that start at $20 a month. So you could really, one of the advantages of this is that you eliminate cable, satellite, other monthly costs by adding in all digital services. So we really want people to do this comparison figure out is this, you know, what does this proposal look like for you? If this were something that we decided to vote on as a community, what, what does it look like for you personally? So we're, we're gonna um, ask that question in the 2021 broadband survey. So I'm gonna just share a little bit of information about this survey. And then Matt and I are gonna do a quick walkthrough of the survey so we can look at it in a little bit greater detail. So if our timing is right, hopefully we'll be able to launch this survey next week. It's an anonymous survey. And as Jan Ann mentioned before, um, it's going to be mailed along with the four page overview that, that, we're talk that we've been talking through. It's gonna be mailed to all taxpayers and it's gonna be mailed to everyone with a 04863 address. It's also going to be available online. Uh, to make responding super simple, we're going to include a self-addressed stamped envelope, and that's going to be included in each of the mailing. And we're also incentivizing taking the survey uh, by offering a $100 cash prize uh, that will be um, chosen through a random drawing. So. Um, we're, I'm gonna go off screen share and Matt is going to share uh, um, his screen so we can actually look at what the survey uh, looks like and we can walk you through it. So question one is pretty straightforward. Um, we're just asking you to uh, uh, tell us if you are a registered voter or if you're not a registered voter, will you be a registered voter? by June, and that's because registered voters are going to be making the decision on this. Um, we also ask you if you're a property owner, aka taxpayer, and that is because taxpayers will be paying for the, uh, would, would be, in this proposal, would be paying for the build out. Question three presents uh, some background for um, the actual proposal question, and the background simply uh, goes over all the things that we just talked about. You know, what would it cost? You know, what would it cost me? And it does this in a succinct way, but it presents the background information. And then the actual question three uh, is, is the proposal. So it's saying, um, you know, if this, you know, would you, would you be in support of this municipal broadband option? Now, keep in mind, this is not a vote. This is not how we vote on things. This is a straw poll. And we're trying to get a sense from the community, like, are people into this or are people not? And with that information, that's how we would proceed with whatever's next. So this is really just to get, test the temperature of the community, test political will, community willingness. So question four is about grants. Um, it, it suggests what kind of grant funding might be available. And then it asks if you're in favor of us pursuing those grants. And question five is for anyone who voted no, like no, they're not in favor of, of supporting this proposal. And I say voted, I should say chose or selected no. Again, this is not a vote. This is, this is a survey, it's a straw poll. 
So if you selected, no, I'm not in favor of supporting this, you would answer question five. And that just aims to get at why uh, you are not in favor of supporting this proposal. And what, if anything, would you be in favor of um, if you don't, if you're not in favor of this proposal? So we want to um, jump quickly to the town website. So that is the paper version of the survey. Just keep in mind the online version is going to look a little different. Um, Matt and I are going to produce a short uh, sort of how to video on the online survey. It's very intuitive. And once we once we get that launched, we'll promote it um, through social media and on our website, but we'll also accompany it with a quick little tutorial that walks people through how to do it. Same questions, just a slightly different format because it's digital. So just to let you all know, since you're here, you're ambassadors, you're either watching this on Facebook or here with us in Zoom, we want you to know that all this information that we've talked about, the history, the reports, everything that the Broadband Committee has done since its inception is available on the town website. And Matt is showing us what that looks like now. Um, we'll also put a link in the chat that gives you direct access to the website. So the survey link is not live on the chat and you won't see the paper version of the survey on, on the website. That's only going to be mailed. But um, the camp, the overview that we've been discussing, that, do, that four page documents on here, um, all of the um, conversations, everything you need to know is on the website. If for some reason, um, you go on there and you think something is missing, do let me know or let JDN know and we'll make sure to get it up there. So we would just want to encourage people to use this as a tool um, when you're out there, you know, talking about broadband, promoting the survey, um, you have questions, go to the website, everything is there. So um, I'm going to go back to my screen share. Thanks so much, Matt. So what is next? Obviously, we're going to launch this survey. And like I said, we're hoping everything lines up and we're able to get this mailing out and we're able to launch the online survey next week. That's not 100%, but that's what we're aiming for. Um, the task force is going to be doing a bunch of outreach. So we're going to do a bunch of calls to the area local to the island area codes. We're going to reach out to community groups and have conversations. Our goal is to really get participants participation. We want a really strong response to this survey. We're hoping to close the survey by mid-April. And then uh, we'll obviously take all of the results, compile them, create um, essentially a survey report. And we're going to pr present that to the select board um, at a um, at a regular uh, select board meeting. So I, uh, Jan and I apologize. I think I just talked over when you were going to speak. So uh, I forgive me for launch, for jumping in there. Quite all right. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just continue going here oh, with, yeah. with the next next step slides. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I'm over over enthusiastic, I guess. Um, me too. <laughs> So um, what happens after we have these survey results? Well, essentially, whatever the results are, that's going to determine how we're going to move forward. So if, if the results are favorable, if this straw poll, which the survey is, um, comes back and most people are in favor, um, and the select board says, hey, this looks like you know, a, good, a good response rate, it looks like a lot of people are in favor of this option, this is what we'd likely do. We'd, we'd need to start working with an internet service provider that we would be able to contract with. Um, and that would hopefully be the internet service provider that we would, um, that would help us with the build out and then essentially um, be providing the uh, service management for us. So that would enable us to get more concrete costs. What we've presented here to you today are estimates. So concrete costs would come from actually working with an internet service provider. 
we would need to draft a warrant article that would specify the, the actual amount that we would need to borrow for the build out of this project. Uh, that would involve then doing a lot more outreach so people are clear on what those specific costs are, what the warrant article is asking. There would be a public hearing in which we would be able to discuss that as a community. And then it would go to vote likely at a special town meeting. So if that warrant article to borrow the amount that we need for our build out was approved, um, we would then likely put out next step a request for a proposal for a design build broadband project. And that would sort of be the launch uh, to get this idea, this proposal, this concept for municipally owned broadband underway. If the survey comes back um, not in favor, the community is saying, nope, we don't like this option, we're not in favor, then the task force and the select board will really need to discuss if and how we're going to move forward. So we've presented the option that we strongly feel aligns with the community's values, um, with what we feel like we need to have for broadband on the island. Um, but if that's not what the community is in favor of, then we will um, go back to the drawing board and see what is next. So, I think with that, I am turning it, this time I actually am turning it back over to you, Jan Ann. I won't, I won't steal your thunder. That's quite all right. I don't mind at all. Um, a couple of points I wanted to make. For those who don't understand what a thousand megabytes up and a thousand down are, I think the fastest speed that you can get from Spectrum is a hundred. And it's less than that up. So that means it is 10 times more faster. Actually, it's, it's more than that because there's some sort of mathematical algorithm. Anyway, it's fast. And as you can see, it's affordable. And we're very excited about the possibilities. So I need all of you to take that survey to share information, meet on the street corner, anybody you talk to, tell them what's happening. Um, I know that a lot of people are looking at Starlink and a lot of other options, but this is by, by far the most affordable and it's going, to, it's going to change so much. I mean, one thing I want to speak just a minute was one of the, the sort of guiding ideas that I started with and I continue with is the idea of sustainability. We want to sustain our way of life on this island. This is going to provide opportunities for people to work remotely at well-paying jobs while they can still live on the island they love. It'll support our seniors and others with telemedicine options, quality and specialized medical care without having to travel back and forth to the mainland. It'll increase options for education, college and technical training right here. And it'll help our small businesses to market their products everywhere. So if we wanna sustain life on Vinyl Haven, this is a critical infrastructure we need to support. So everybody take the survey because we have got to be able to convince well, basically the select board, that this is what the community wants and what they're willing to go for. So let us know. And if you run into any problems, any questions of any kind, be sure and get a hold of me or Gabe. We're always available and we're so committed to making this work. I think that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jan and and um... I just wanted to say before, well, I'm, I'm pleased we have, a, we have got a full half hour to do our Q&A. And I know we're having a lot of uh, questions that have come in already. And I'm really uh, pleased about that. But I just want to encourage you to keep putting your questions in the chat or Facebook comments. And um, we'll be collecting those and addressing those as they come in. So before um, we launch into the Q&A, I just want to um, make it clear who we have here tonight to answer our questions. So as you know, Jan Ann is here 
Um, and Andy Dorr, um, our town manager, and um, Donald, or DW Poole, are both joining us from the town office tonight. And as you know, um, DW is a select board member, but he is also a member of the task force. So we're lucky to have him here tonight. And then Kendra Jo Grindle from the Island Institute, who has served as our broadband technical advisor throughout um, essentially throughout our time here, uh, especially during the campaign, but certainly since 2020 when we started, uh, or 2019 when we started down the road of the 2020 broadband report. So um, for technical questions, grant questions, or anything probably related to other communities broadband, um, we have Kendra Jo to help us with those questions. Um, if you know who you wanna direct your question to um, when you post it, just say that in the, in the chat. And like I said, we'll take these written questions first and then we'll likely open it up to verbal questions towards the end of our conversation. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, move over and see what we have coming in for questions um, so we can get started. All right, so let's just start with um, a general question. And this looks like um, it might go to Kendra Joe because it is about grant funding. And this has to do with sort of offsetting the total cost. So I'll just read this question. So um, I've heard there's more grant money becoming available uh, through Con Connect Maine. Will that mean that we may be able to reduce our cost by more than the 1.5 million we are, or you are estimating now. So Kendra Joe, do you have any exciting new grant information or possibilities of more grant funding for us? There's definitely possibilities. It's in the gov uh, governor's budget proposal to put more money towards uh, broadband. There are a couple of bills that are currently being reviewed for this legislation period that also have uh, money written in for the Connect Main Authority. Um, we will see what happens with those. You know, the pandemic has definitely um, changed some conversations around what it means to bond in the state and um, the willingness that the state has to move forward um, substantially large chunks of money. Um, beyond that, if and that's to say we hopefully will have more money beyond the $15 million that's available in this current grant round um, in 2021. That is to say that the cost um, that's proposed, the estimate of 1.5 million, that's really based on the current unserved areas in Vinyl Haven. And um, that, that will not go up. Um, if anything, it could potentially decrease. Um, I don't foresee that happening in the next year, but um, that's a pretty safe estimate. And also when it comes time to apply for any grant, it's on the, the committee or the town that's writing the application to really understand um, what their ask is to make themselves the most competitive application um, possible. And um, one of the highest scoring criteria for the Connect Main Authority is written in their role and that's price per pass or the price to bring fiber or that technology to each home that is being served. And so it'll be on the committee and the town to understand you know, what makes them the most competitive based on the scoring criteria at the time. So I think that's a really safe estimate. Um, it could go up a little, but it could also decrease a little. Could I add something? Of course. Well, I was listening to Maine Calling today. Senator Angus King um, was on there along with representatives from GWI, from Tilson, and I think from the Maine Broadband Coalition. And, he, and um, Senator King was announcing that in the COVID bill, there's a lot of money for broadband and he anticipates that Maine will receive a minimum of a hundred million additional dollars, perhaps as much as 120 or 130 million that will go to Connect Maine to be dispersed for state projects. So I, I got very excited about that. Um, it sounds like we're gonna have a bigger pot of money than we ever anticipated. 
And I hope that Vinyl Haven will be in a good position now, as far along as we are with our planning, uh, to be able to get some of that money to help us build it. Thanks, Jan Ann. So I think this is a, sort of along, it is along the sim, similar lines in, in, in having to do with grant funding and Kendrick, are you, I think you, you, pro, you probably address this, but also to be asking a slightly different way. Um, so when, when towns, and we'll just use Vinyl Haven, so when we, when we go to, um, so I guess this has to do with sequencing. Um, so will we, we will we, um, Okay, I'm going to try to ask this the, the most succinct way. So when a town is going to apply for grant funding, does it matter if they have uh, essentially approved to fund that entire project before they go for grant funding to offset it? Or would the town say, oh, well, we know that we can likely offset this cost by 1.5 million. So we won't we won't put a warrant out for that full amount we'll we'll put the warrant out for this amount and then hope that we get the rest for through grants like you know can you talk a little bit about what sort of the best strategy is and like you know how a town goes about doing that yeah so the the best strategy that we've seen um both from the community side and for being competitive on grant applications whether it's at the state level or the federal level is to seek a do not exceed amount. So find what your estimate is, um, which this community has, and put something on the warrant that, that shows that number and it's a do not exceed number with the idea that after you approve it, that number could potentially go down, but it wouldn't go higher. One reason that's a good strategy is you don't wanna to have to go back to your town twice if you end up not being able to get grant funding or private donation or whatever other creative capital stack that you've managed for your community. The other is having the community vote forward a project in its full amount puts you in a position that you're showing through that vote that you have, you know, you have community buy-in, you have community engagement. This won't be an infrastructure that will be built and just be dark fiber. So it's, it's there, it's not really used, there aren't subscribers. The state and the federal government needs to know that there is community members, residents that are willing and, and ready to take that service. And showing a town vote shows that those residents are bought into the service, are willing to engage with it, and are prioritizing it as a community. So for those that look at, oh, if we fund all of it, then that makes us less competitive because we show that we can fund it. It's actually the opposite. Show that you are willing to prioritize it enough as a community and you are you are making the case that your community is willing to put forward that amount of money and then watch that number come down through grants or through private donation. Um, it really does get your score higher. It makes it so that the community is able to, like I previously mentioned, submit an application best based on you know, how you position yourself scoring wise instead of forcing your hand and saying, we have to seek this because we only you know, we only went to the town for 3.5 instead of the full five. Um, having that flexibility makes it so that when you get to grant applications or when you get to doing fundraising, you're able to um, be a little bit more dynamic and strategic about how you move forward instead of being locked into a solid number. Great, that was super helpful. Thank you so much. So I want to get to a couple of questions that are sort of related to um, spectrum. One is a one is a simple, well, seemingly simple question. Um, I don't know if, if a task force member can answer this, but um, someone would like to know: um, Does spectrum have fiber on the island? And Jan Ann, I think you can probably answer that one. The best that I understand, and maybe Andy would be better at answering this, but my understanding is, is that Spectrum leases some fiber from Fox Island Electric, and they use that for their backbone. Um, but I don't know the extent of it or anything. Somebody once told me to come down 
North Haven Road right outside my house. And I think they only did that to make me feel bad. <laughs> um, no, I, I, this is, oh, oh, Pat, yeah, sure, sure, Pat, go ahead, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's a little complicated. So that's right, Janan, they, they lease some fiber from the co-op. Um, they also have some fiber, but I don't know. I thought the question might refer to whether they have fiber to the home and the answer to that is no. Great. So they, yeah. they have some some bits of fiber that uh, make their network work, but it's it's not a fiber to the home service. Uh, although I will say, Janan, Spectrum, the speeds have increased some. They're nothing like what we would like. They're very asymmetrical, but the speeds can approach about 400 down. And what is, do you, can you estimate what that costs? Yeah, I think it's about, uh, I think I have 200 megs and it's about $70. So I'm not sure. I think there's 400 and I don't, I don't yet think on the island they have what they call gigabit, which is more like 900. And again, one of the challenges with some of these providers is they don't have to really adhere to a true SLA. They're highly asymmetrical. So I forget what my upload speed is. It's, you know, in the twenties or maybe 30 megs. Um, so I'm certainly not defending it, but the, the download speeds have increased some and, but, but it's not, it's not gigabit symmetrical service. It's not fiber to the home. So hopefully that helps. Great. Thanks. And uh, for those of you who don't know, well, we did say Pat McCormick is a member of the task force. We, we, um, we presented that at the beginning. Thanks for jumping in, Pat. And um, I do know that um, Spectrum does does lease um, fiber from uh, Glen Cove and Rockland um, th from Fox Island Electric through their undersea cable to North Haven, and then they own their own fiber background back backbone on North Haven, their own undersea fiber cable um, across the thoroughfare, and their own fiber backbone um, along the North Haven Road. So that's the extent of, um, of fiber. So they do have some, uh, some fiber network, but as Pat said, it's, it's, not, it's, not a complete, um, it's not a complete network. Um, so there is a question about symmetrical service. And I don't know if anyone, maybe Pat, you would like to um, answer this question. Um, um, what, what do we mean when we say symmetrical mm. service? Yeah, you know, one way people describe it, so there's uploads and downloads, and sometimes we talk about downloads as consumers, whether we're um, downloading a large photo or a movie or um, all kinds of things, maybe a software package. Uploads we sometimes refer to as being a creative. If I made a movie or I'm editing a movie or I, I have some very high resolution photos, and I want to put them on the web or send them to someone, that's uploading. So the pipe goes both ways. What we see mostly in the market today is uh, much higher download speeds and upload speeds. And a lot of the companies in the marketplace will say, well, that's what consumers want. Um, I mean, certainly a lot of what people do on the internet, you know, which resembles television and movies and all of that, um, is in that direction. The thing is that the, the networks, whether it's a telco or a cable company, they're trying to extract as much bandwidth as they can. They favor downloads because it's some combination of what people want and what they will get. Um, but if we're looking ahead or we're thinking about a creative economy and we're thinking about more sophisticated uses, whether it's being a creator, um, being a developer of any kind, or perhaps creating a lot of jobs on Vinyl Haven, which um, would require uploading data um, to the web or, or having a server or something like that, then upload speeds become really important. Another way to look at it is symmetrical service could open the doors to more kinds of jobs, more uses of the internet. Certainly it's talked a lot about in education. Again, it's not true for everything, but there are plenty of things where an upload, a high upload speed and that symmetrical service would make for much more innovative um, uses of the internet. Great, thank you so much, Pat. Um, so just, I think this is a question that comes up with, especially with this proposal because we have incumbent providers and 
we talk a lot about people with um, spectrum service and I'm one of them, I have spectrum, I live in town. Um, and you know, those of us who have spectrum and are satisfied with the service, um, there's one question that's specific to the survey around spectrum, which is, um, you know, do we have um, anything on the survey that identifies people um, as uh, having a particular uh, carrier, uh, either spectrum or CCI as a way to sort of indicate like, I don't want this service or I'm not in favor of supporting a service because I'm a Spectrum customer. So I can answer that question unless Chan Ann, you wanna answer that question. Okay, yeah, so the, the, the answer to that is no, there's nothing that says um, I'm a Spectrum customer and that's why I don't want it. There's simply, I, I support this, I don't support this. Um, and um, you know, what might I be willing to support? Um, lesser money um, or just, I just outright don't think that the town should be uh, supporting this service so we don't we don't dive into um, I don't support it because I'm a spectrum customer so um, along those same lines um, this question of you know sort of why why would I be interested in this if I'm a if I have spectrum um, what sort of what's in it for me like why would I want to pay for a service like maybe I won't even use um, what's the benefit to me um, as a member of this community to support this proposal through taxation if I choose to continue purchasing or subscribing to Spectrum or Consolidated. And I don't know if, you know, maybe DW or Andy or Jan Ann, uh, if one of you want to address uh, that question. I, I can, yeah. Super, thank you, DW. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Um, I would, well, personally, I would say I, I, I live here. I just built a house a few years ago, grew up here, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, I work from home. I worked from home before the pandemic, and I would say I work from home full time now. I recently called Spectrum to try to get hooked up to their service, which I'm a quarter mile away from was willing to pay to be hooked up. They will not do it. Consolidated, I called them, complained about their service over and over again. They're not talking about increasing speeds out here for another two years. So for me, this is the best option personally, but I agree with what Janan has said. This is good for our community going forward. And yes, Spectrum customers, maybe you don't want to pay for something or you're not going to hook up to the system but it will benefit others like myself or other families who maybe want to move here and can work remotely or maybe someone's getting closer to retirement and they can still work remotely um, and, but they're going to be working less but they'd like to live here it's it's going to be better for kids who are growing up in a much more competitive world where everything is done online and if you have reliable fast internet speeds it's going to give you an advantage in that in that arena, so I, I personally would, you know, ask people to think about that. And yes, maybe you won't sign up for the system for the system, but if you are willing to help pay for it, it will help the rest of the community. So please think of everyone when you uh, fill out the questionnaire. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great, right. thank you, DW. Is anybody else, uh, Jan Ann, you'd like to add to that? Well, I was just going to reiterate what I said earlier, which is this is a utility. This is for everybody. Um, I don't ever go out Calderwood Road, but, but I help pay for it. I don't have kids in school. I don't have anything to do with the school, but I help pay for it for the good of the community. And when you think of it in that way, it isn't just about you or whether you're going to use Spectrum or not. The other thing I'd urge is people who are paying for Spectrum to take a look at the money, even paying with the bond and, and the, the subscriber fees for what we're proposing, it's nowhere near what they're paying Spectrum. Um, and so maybe they could do something good with that money to, to support the whole community. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, oh. I'll add a couple points. Sure, Pat, thank you. You know, I think um, 
I agree with what, what's been said. I'm a Spectrum customer too. Um, I think, I think um, there's a question of equity on the island. And I think, um, you know, the fact that some of us have faster services is not great. I mean, we want all the kids on the island to have the same kind of opportunity. You know, that's, that's what people are talking about, particularly in COVID, digital equity. And um, we want, uh, it, it benefits the island. We want businesses to have better options wherever they might be on the island. Um, so I think there are a lot of reasons, um, even if you, if someone were to want to remain a Spectrum customer. Having said that, <clears throat> I think um, if not, you know, cheaper, depending on how it's structured, you know, even for the same money, I would be looking forward to better service. I'd be looking forward to spending my money on the island, not sending it off to Spectrum and having a level of, of control of our destiny that we don't. I mean, even if you're happy with Spectrum today, you might not be tomorrow. And that's a company, that's a space where we see all kinds of things happening. Um, the regulatory environment changes with the FCC and Spectrum may or may not uh, do things with your data. Um, it may or may not, um, you know, provide an innovative service. So, um, you know, there's there are a lot of reasons why um, one might switch. And even if one doesn't switch, it would be to the benefit of the island, you know, as a whole and to the community and just open up more doors to all kinds of business um, opportunities and educational opportunities. And uh, the last thing I'll say is I know people tend to think about when you talk about the internet and, and education and work, you know, we think high tech, but actually everything is impacted by the internet today, whether it's telehealth and I guarantee you fishing in the future will be more internet and technology empowered. And um, we will get behind on things and not have new opportunities, even related to very traditional work. Um, if, we, if we don't have the same access uh, to the, the, the internet that we could. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Pat. And yeah, thanks DW and thanks Jan Ann. I think that was a great way of adjust, addressing that question. Um, so we just have um, a, a short amount of time left and um, I do wanna save uh, a, a few minutes for um, some uh, verbal questions if anyone has them. So uh, one question I did wanna turn over to uh, my colleague, Matt Jablonski, who has been um, working behind the scenes, uh, doing some GIS mapping with a company called Vetro. And this is to answer the question I kept referring to outer islands. So when we talk about the area um, that is going to be um, that when I say outer islands or what is included um, as vinyl haven and not an outer island, um, I want to turn it over real quick to Matt to show us um, what is um, encompassed in vinyl, vinyl haven versus an outer island. Matt, are you able to, to do that for us? Yeah, uh, I will share my screen right here. Um, and here you can see uh, this is this uh, platform courtesy of a broadband company based out of Portland that we've been using for the last couple months. Um, and here is what the build out uh, as proposed in the uh, 2020 broadband report that uh, we produced uh, last year. Uh, it would be a three phase build out of you know full fiber to the premise of in uh, each residential and commercial. Uh, property on the island. And uh, so the outer islands and Gabe was referring to are not included in this. And an outer island is basically any island that might have a residence uh, around Vinyl Haven, but you can't walk or drive to pretty much. And so I think in the question, there was one about lanes. So all the residences on lanes would be uh, connected to the network. Same with over on Dyers um, and up on Barton. And then the same with the uh, up on Calderwood Neck, uh, kind of basically almost the every, every part of the island that uh, is inhabited at the moment would be included in the, and uh, in, in the actual physical island of uh, Vinyl Haven would be included in the build out. And like Gabe said, if there's uh, interest and, you know, more discussion about including, you know, say Ledbetter or uh, even Hurricane potentially, um, 
it certainly could be, it's, it's not set in stone at the moment, um, but this is how it is uh, as, as of right now. Great, thanks so much, Matt. Um, so we just have a few minutes left and I wanted to make sure that we were able to address any questions verbally if folks, um, you know, if anyone had a question they wanted to come off mute real quick, we just have a few minutes, but we'd be happy to address um, any verbal questions that folks want to present in the last few minutes we have here. Hi, John. Hi. Um, Gabe, I, I asked a question. I may have missed this because I came late, but will the vote on this be by a ballot or by a town meeting? So it will likely be at a special town meeting. So there'll be a warrant article drafted there would be a public hearing and then likely the timing would be such that it would need to be a special town meeting and not annual town meeting. Yeah, so proponents would have to make sure to show up, I would guess. And voting is eligible for all of us, right? If we have our taxpayers on the own. If you are a register, if you are a Vinyl Haven resident, uh, I think that just means, is it six months? Does anyone know oh, well, what it takes to be a registered voter? Oh, you Andy have to Dorf. be a registered voter, right? Okay, well, that's okay. I thought you said and taxpayers. So, so we are we're we've we're sending this to all taxpayers because right. taxpayers would be paying for the build out, whether you're a, what, a resident or not. Yeah, I'd like once an official again taxation list. without representation, but that's another issue. So. Thanks, John. Any okay. other any other questions? If, if you have one, just come right off of mute and go ahead and ask. I want to congratulate Matt for holding that smile during this whole thing. Matt's very talented. Yeah. Okay, any uh, quick closing comments um, from any of our, um, I say, I don't want to call us panelists, but um, Kendra Joe, Jan Ann, Andy, DW, um, Jan Ann? Well, I just want to say, I'm sure that there'll be some questions come up, especially as you start talking with your friends and so forth about this. So don't hesitate to call me. Um, I don't know if we've got my phone number on there, but, I, but mine's easy to remember. It's 867-2000. If I don't know, I'll know who to ask. Great. And there's so my email. Maybe we can just pop that in the chat, 867-2000. Jan Ann yeah. is welcoming phone calls. Um, if you wanna reach me, my number is available on the town website. You can just punch my name into the search box and, and um, or just email me, I'll send you my phone number. Um, so we definitely want to encourage again, everyone to use the website. Um, this is the direct URL to get to the Fox Island Broadband Task Force page. It's listed under uh, committees, um, but go there, get all this info, um, reach out to any of us, questions, comments, feedback, um, anything you need to know, our emails are here. And um, look for that survey. Like I said, hopefully next week will be the launch. Um, I do have a broadband email list. I'll send you um, an email, just letting you know that it's gonna be there. We'll, we'll send an email through the town website. It'll be on social media and everyone will get something in the mail. So with that, I'll go back off of screen share. And just thank everybody for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, look for, again, look for the survey and then follow up um, uh, information from us once we have those survey responses um, back and compiled. So thanks um, to Jan Ann, Kendra Joe, Andy, DW, and Matt. Appreciate your help tonight and for joining us. And thanks to all of you for being here. We appreciate it. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks.